The new stage in the struggle for women's liberation already stands on a higher ideological level than did the feminist movement of the last century. Many of the participants today respect the Marxist analysis of capitalism and subscribe to Engels' classic explanation of the origins of women's oppression. It came about through the development of class society uh, founded upon the family, private property, and the state. But there still are many misunderstandings and misinterpretations of Marxist positions which have led some women who consider themselves radicals or socialists to go off course and to become theoretically disoriented. They're influenced by the myth that women have always been handicapped by their childbearing functions, and so they tend to attribute the roots of women's oppression, at least in part, uh, to biological sexual differences. In actuality, its causes are exclusively historical and social in character. Some of these theorists maintain that women constitute a special class or caste. Such definitions are not only alien to the views of Marxism, but lead to the false conclusion, which is more openly and bluntly expressed uh, by other women, that it is not the capitalist system, but men who are the prime enemy of women. And I propose in this talk to challenge this contention. The findings of the Marxist method, which have laid the groundwork for explaining the genesis of women's degradation, can be summed up in the following two propositions. One, women were not always the oppressed or second sex. Anthropology tells us just the contrary. Uh, throughout primitive society, which was the epoch of tribal collectivism, women were the equals of men and recognized by them as such. Two, the downfall of women coincided with the breakup of the matriarchal clan commune and its replacement by class-divided society with its institutions of, of the patriarchal family of private property and the state. Now, the key factors that brought about this reversal in women's social status came out of the transition from a hunting and food gathering economy to a far higher mode of production based upon agriculture, stock raising, and urban crafts. The primitive division of labor between the sexes was replaced by a more complex social division of labor. The greater efficiency of that labor uh, of that labor gave rise to a sizable surplus product which led first to differentiations and then to deep going divisions between the various segments of society. By virtue of the directing roles played by men in large scale agriculture, irrigation and construction projects, as well as in stock raising, this surplus wealth was gradually appropriated by a hierarchy of men as their private property. This, in turn, required the institution of marriage and the family to fix the legal ownership and inheritance of a man's property. And so, through monogamous marriage, the wife was brought under the complete control of her husband, who was thereby assured of legitimate sons to inherit his wealth. As men took over most of the activities of social production, and with the rise of the family institution, women were relegated to the home to serve their husbands and families. The state apparatus came into ex existence to fortify and legalize the inheritance of private property, of male dominion, and of the father family, which later was sanctified by religion. Now this in brief, is the Marxist approach to the origins of women's oppression. Her subordination did not come about through any biological deficiency as a sex. It was the result of the revolutionary social changes which destroyed the equalitarian society of the matriarchal gens, or clan, and replaced it with a patriarchal class society, which from its birth was stamped with discriminations and inequalities of many kinds, including the inequality of the sexes. 
the growth of this inherently oppressive type of socio-economic organization was responsible for the historic downfall of the women. However, the downfall of the women cannot be fully understood or a correct social and political solution worked out for their liberation without seeing what happened at the same time to the men. It is too often overlooked that the patriarchal class system, which crushed the matriarchy and its communal social relations, also shattered its male counterpart, the fratriarchy, or as it's more commonly known, the tribal brotherhood of men. Women's overthrow went hand in hand with the subjugation of the mass of toiling men uh, to a small group and master class of men. Now the import of these developments can be more clearly seen if we examine the basic character of the tribal structure which Morgan, Engels, and the others described as a system of primitive communism. The clan commune was both a sisterhood of women and a brotherhood of men. The sisterhood of women, which was the essence of the matriarchy, denoted its collectivist character. The women worked together as a community of sisters, and their social labors largely sustained the whole community. They also raised their children in common. An individual mother did not draw distinctions between her own and her clan sisters' progeny, and the children, in turn, regarded all these older sisters as their mutual mothers. In other words, communal production and communal possessions were accompanied by communal child-raising. The male counterpart of this sisterhood was the brotherhood which was molded in the same communal pattern as the sisterhood. Each clan or freight tree of clans comprising the tribe was regarded as a brotherhood from the male standpoint, just as they viewed themselves as sisterhoods or motherhoods from the female standpoint. And in this matriarchal brotherhood, the adults of both sexes not only produced the necessities of life together, but also provided for and protected the children of the community, and it was these features that made the sisterhood and the brotherhood a system of primitive communism. And so before the family came into existence that had the individual father standing at its head, the functions of fatherhood were a social and not a family function of men. More than this, the earliest men who performed the services of fatherhood were not the husbands of the clan sisters, but rather their clan brothers. And this was not simply because the processes of physiological paternity were still unknown in primitive society. More decisively, this fact was irrelevant in a society founded upon collectivist relations of production and communal child raising. Now, however odd it may seem to people like ourselves who are so accustomed to the family form of child raising, it was perfectly natural in the primitive commune <clears throat> for the clan brothers, or mother's brothers as they are often called, to perform the paternal functions for their sister's children that were later taken over by the individual father for his wife's children. The first change in this sisterhood and brotherhood clan system came with the growing tendency of for pairing couples or pairing families, as they're called by Morgan, <clears throat> to live together in the same community and household. However, this simple cohabitation did not substantially alter the former collectivist relations or the productive role of women in the community. The sexual division of labor, which had formerly been allotted between clan sisters and brothers, gradually became transformed into a sexual division of labor between husbands and wives. But so long as collectivist relations prevailed and women continued to participate in social production, 
the original equality between the sexes more or less persisted. The whole community continued to sustain the pairing couples, just as each individual member of these units made his and her contribution to the labor activities of the whole community. So, the pairing family, which appeared at the dawn of the family system, differed very radically from the nuclear family of our times. In this ruthless, competitive, capitalist system, every tiny little family must sink or swim through its own efforts. It can't count on any assistance from outside sources. The wife is dependent upon the husband, while the children must look to a parent or two for their subsistence, even if these wage earners are unemployed or stricken by illness. In the period of the pairing family, however, there was no such dependency upon family economics since the whole community took care of all the needs of all the individuals involved. And this was the material basis for the absence in the primitive commune of the social oppression and family antagonisms with which we are so familiar and which stem from this kind of family economics. Now it's sometimes said or implied that male domination has always existed and that women have always been brutally treated by men. And contrarywise, it is said just the opposite, that relations between the sexes in matriarchal society were merely the reverse of our own, with women dominating men. But neither of these propositions are borne out by the anthropological evidence. Now, it is not my intention to glorify the epoch of savagery and, or advocate a return to some romantic golden age. No. An economy founded upon hunting and gathering is the lowliest economy in human history, and its living conditions were rude, crude, and harsh. However, we must recognize that male and female relations in their kind of society were fundamentally different from our own. Under the clan system of sisterhood of women and the brotherhood of men, there could be no possibility for one sex to dominate the other than there could be a possibility for one class to exploit another. Women occupied the most eminent position because they were the chief producers of the necessities of life as well as the procreators of new life. But this did not make them the oppressors of men. Their communal society excluded class racial, social, or sexual tyranny. But as Engels points out, with the rise of private property, monogamous marriage, and the patriarchal family, new social forces came into play in both society at large and in the family setup, which destroyed the rights exercised by earliest womankind. From simple cohabitation of pairing couples, there arose the rigidly fixed legal system of monogamous marriage, and that is the essence of monogamy, a legal and propertied system. This brought the wife and children under the complete control of her husband and father, uh, who gave the family his name and determined its conditions of life and its destiny. And so women who had once lived and worked as a community of sisters raising their children in common now became dispersed as wives of individual men serving their lords and masters in individual households. The former equalitarian sexual division of labor between the men and women of the commune gave way to a family division of labor in which the women were more and more removed from social production to serve as household drudges for husband, home, and family. Thus women, once the governesses of society, as they were called, especially here by the American Indians, were degraded under class society, each to become the governess of a man's children and his chief housemaid. Now this debasement of women has been a permanent feature of all three stages of class society from slavery through feudalism to capitalism. 
So long as women led or participated in the productive work of the whole community, they commanded respect and esteem. But once they were dismembered into separate family units, each occupying a servile position in home and family, they lost their prestige along with their influence and power. Is it any wonder that such a drastic social change should bring about intense and long-enduring antagonism between the sexes? Because as Engels puts it, and I want you to pay attention to this because very often people say that sex oppression is very, very old and antedates class society. It does not. It comes in together with class society. And let me quote from Engels on that point. <clears throat> Monogamy then does by no means enter history as a reconciliation of man and wife and still less as the highest form of marriage. On the contrary, it enters as the subjugation of one sex by the other, as the proclamation of an antagonism between the sexes unknown in all preceding history. The first class antagonism appearing in history coincides with the development of the antagonisms between man and wife in monogamy, and the first class oppression with that of the female by the male sex. <clears throat> so it is necessary to note a distinction. Here I make a distinction in the, in the forms of the family. Between two degrees of women's oppression in this monogamous family. In the productive farm family of the pre-industrial age, women held a higher status and were accorded more respect than they received in the consumer family of our own city life, which is called the nuclear family. So long as agriculture and craft industry remained dominant in the economy, the farm family, which was a large or extended family, remained a viable productive unit. All the members had vital functions in it according to sex and age. The women in the family helped to cultivate the ground and engaged in home industries as well as in bearing the children, while the children and the older folks produced their share according to their age and ability. Now all this changed with the rise of industrial and monopoly capitalism and the nuclear family. Once masses of men were dispossessed from the land and small businesses to become wage earners in factories, they had nothing but their labor power to sell to the capitalist bosses for their means of subsistence. The wives of these wage workers, ousted from their former productive farm and home craft labors, became utterly dependent upon their husbands for the support of themselves and their children. As men became dependent upon their bosses, their wives became more dependent upon their husbands. And so by degrees, as women were stripped of their economic self-dependence, they fell ever lower in the social esteem. At the beginning of class society, they had been removed from social production and social leadership to become farm family producers working through their husbands and home, for their homes and families. But with the displacement of the productive farm family by the nuclear consuming family of industrial city life, they were driven from their last foothold on solid ground. And so then women were given two dismal alternatives. They could either seek a husband as a provider and be penned up thereafter as housewives in city tenements and apartments, to raise the next generation of wage slaves. Or the poorest and most unfortunate of them could go as marginal workers into the mills and factories along with the children and be sweated as the most downtrodden and underpaid section of the labor force. Now over the generations, <clears throat> women wage workers have conducted their own labor struggles or fought along with men for improvements in their wages and working conditions. But women as dependent housewives have had no such means of social struggle. They could only resort to complaints or wrangles with husbands and children over their miserable lives. And the frictions between the sexes became deeper and sharper 
with this abject dependency of women and their subservience to men. Now, despite the hypocritical homage paid to womankind as the sacred mother and devoted homemaker, the worth of women sank to its lowest point under capitalism. Since housewives do not produce commodities for the market, nor create any surplus value for the profiteers, they are not central to its operations. Only three justifications for their existence remain under this system. As breeders, as uh, household janitors, and as buyers of consumers' goods for the family to set up. Now, while wealthy women can hire servants to do the dull chores for them, poor women are riveted to an endless grind of these chores for their whole lives and their condition of servitude is compounded when they are obliged to take on outside jobs to help sustain the family. Shouldering two responsibilities instead of one, they become the doubly oppressed. Even middle-class housewives, despite their economic advantages, are victimized by capitalism. The isolated, monotonous, trivial circumstances of their lives lead them to living through their children, a relationship which fosters many of the neuroses that afflict family life today. And in seeking to allay their boredom, they can be played upon and preyed upon by the profiteers in the consumer's goods fields. And this exploitation of women as consumers today is part and parcel of a system that grew up in the first place and from the beginning for the exploitation of men as producers. The capitalists, of course, have ample reason for glorifying the nuclear family. Its petty household is a gold mine for all sorts of hucksters, from the real estate interests to the manufacturers of detergents and cosmetics. Just as autos are produced for individual use instead of developing adequate mass transportation. So the big corporations can make more money by selling small homes on private lots to be equipped with individual washing machines, refrigerators, and other such items. They find all this much more profitable than building large-scale housing at low rentals or developing community services and child care centers. In the second place, the dismemberment of women, each enclosed in a private home tied to the same kitchen and nursery chores, hinders them from banding together to become a strong social force and a political threat to the establishment. What is the most instructive lesson to be drawn from this highly condensed survey of the long imprisonment of womankind in the home and family of class society, and which stands in such marked contrast to their stronger, more independent position in pre-class society. It shows that the inferior status of the female sex is not the result of their biological makeup or the fact that they are child bearers. Child bearing, you must remember, was no handicap in the primitive commune it became a handicap, above all, in the nuclear family of our times. The, the poor women who are torn apart, apart by conflicting obligations of taking care of their children at home, while at the same time seeking work outside the home to help sustain the family. So women then have been condemned in their, to their oppressed status by the same social forces and relations which have brought about the oppression of one class by another, one race by another, and one nation by another. It is the capitalist system, the ultimate stage in the development of class society, which is the fundamental source of the degradation and oppression of women. Now let me turn to the key question of whether women are a separate caste or class. Some women in the liberation movement dispute the fundamental theses of Marxism as I have explained them in this section up to now. They say that the female sex represents a separate caste or class 
T. Grace Atkinson takes the position that women are a separate class. Roxanne Dunbar, that they comprise a separate caste. So let's examine these two theoretical positions and the conclusions that flow from them. First, are women a separate caste? The caste hierarchy came first in history, and it was the prototype and predecessor of the class system. It arose after the breakup of the tribal commune and the emergence of the uh, first marked differentiations uh, of the segments of society according to the new divisions of labor and social function. Membership in a superior or inferior station was established by being born into that caste, which is distinguished from the class system. But it's important to note that the caste system arose, in, when it arose, was at birth a class system. Furthermore, while the caste system reached its fullest development only in certain regions of the world, such as India, the class system evolved far beyond it to become a world system, which eventually engulfed even the caste system. And this can be clearly seen in India itself, where each of the four chief castes, the Brahmins or priests, the soldiers, the farmers and merchants, and then finally the laborers, along with the outcasts or pariahs, each had their appropriate places in an exploitative society. In India today, where the ancient caste system still survives in decadent forms, capitalist relations and power prevail over all the inherited pre-capitalist institutions, including these caste relics. However, those regions of the world which advanced fastest and farthest on the road to civilization bypassed or overleaped altogether the caste system. Western civilization which started with ancient Greece and Rome, developed from slavery through feudalism to the maturest stage of class society, capitalism. And neither in the caste system nor the class system or their combinations have women comprised a separate caste or class. Women have themselves been separated into the various castes and classes which make up these social formations. So the fact that women occupy an inferior status as a sex does not ipso facto make women either an inferior caste or class. Even in ancient India, women have belonged to different castes just as they belong to different classes in contemporary capitalist society. In the one case, their social status was determined by birth into a caste, in the other, it is determined by their own or their husband's wealth. But the two can be fused for women as for men. Both sexes can belong to a superior caste and possess superior wealth, power, and status. So then I asked the question in this uh, presentation I had, where does Roxanne Dunbar stand and what does she want to convey when she refers to all women, regardless of class, as comprising a separate caste. And what consequences for action does she draw from this characterization? Because the exact content of both her premise and her conclusion weren't clear to me and, and to many other people. And I said, speaking in a popular and loose way, it's possible to refer to women as an inferior caste as is sometimes done when they're called slaves or serfs. The intent here being merely to indicate the subordinate position of women in our male-dominated society. But in that case, the use of the term caste would only expose the impoverishment of our language, which has no special word to indicate womankind as an oppressed sex. But from Roxanne Dunbar's paper, it seemed to me to, uh, to have a different connotation. 
and I used her position paper dated February 1970, uh, which superseded her previous positions and was the one that she was making her presentation on. In that document, she said that her characterization of women as an exploited caste was nothing new, that Marx and Engels likewise had analyzed, and I quote, the position of the female sex in just such a way, end quote. But this is not the case. Neither Marx in Capital nor Engels in Origin of the Family nor in any writings by noted Marxists from Lenin to Luxembourg on this subject has woman been defined by virtue of her sex as a caste. Therefore, what we have here is not a mere verbal squabble over the misuse of a term. What we have is a distinct departure from Marxism, although it is presented in the name of Marxism. And I asked what her position was on this point, and I also wanted clarification on another point, on the conclusion that she drew from her theory. For if all women belong to an inferior caste, and all men belong to a superior caste, it would consistently follow that um, the uh, central axis of a struggle for liberation would be a caste war of all women against all men to bring about such liberation. And this conclusion would seem to be confirmed by Roxanne's statement in the same document, and I quote, that we live under an international caste system. Now this assertion is also non-Marxist. What the Marxists say is that we live under an international class system. And they say still further that it will require not a caste war, but a class struggle of all the oppressed, male and female alike, to consummate women's liberation along with the liberation of all the oppressed masses. And I asked the question as to whether she agreed or disagreed with this viewpoint on the class struggle. Now, her conclusion points up the necessity for using very precise language in a scientific exposition. And I'm going to have a lot more to say on this in some future writings. Because however downtrodden women are under capitalism, they are not chattel slaves any more than they are feudal serfs or members of an inferior caste. The, these social categories of slaves Surf and caste refer to stages and features of past history that do not correctly define the position of women in our society. And so if we are going to be precise and scientific, we must define women at the present stage of our terminology as an oppressed sex. Now turning to the other position, it's even more incorrect to characterize women as a, a special class. In Marxist sociology, a class is defined in two interrelated ways, by the role it plays in the processes of production and by the stake it has in the ownership of property. So we find that the capitalists are the major power in our society because they own the means of production and thereby control the state and direct the economy. The wage workers who control the wealth and own nothing but their labor power, which they have to sell, to stay alive. <clears throat> so where do women stand in relation to these uh, polar class forces? They belong to all strata of the social pyramid. The few at the top are part of the plutocratic class. There are more among us who belong to the middle classes. Most of us belong to the proletarian layers of the population. And as you all know, there is an enormous spread uh, from the few wealthy women of the Rockefeller, Morgan, and Ford families to the millions of poor women who subsist on a welfare dole. In short, women, like men, are a multi-class sex. Now let me say that this is not an attempt to divide women from one another, but simply 
uh, to recognize the actual divisions that do exist. The notion that all women as a sex have more in common than do members of the same class with one another is false. Upper class women are not simply bedmates of their wealthy husbands. As a rule, they have more compelling ties which bind them together. And these are economic, social, and political ties. They are united in defense of private property, profiteering, militarism, racism, and the exploitation of other women. Now it's true that there are some individual exceptions to this rule, especially, we can say, among young women today. And in the past, there was uh, Mrs. Frank Leslie, for example, who left a $2 million uh, bequest to further the cause of women's suffrage. And other middle class and upper class women have devoted some of their means to secure civil rights for our sex. <clears throat> but this is quite another matter than to expect any large number of wealthy women to endorse or support a revolutionary struggle which threatens their capitalist interests and privileges. Most of them scorn the liberation movement, saying openly or implicitly, what do we need to be liberated from? And to stress this point, let us examine the tens of thousands of women who went to the Washington anti-war demonstrations on November 15 last year and again this year and they're coming up against this fall. Now do these women have more in common with the militant men marching beside them on that life and death issue or with Mrs. Nixon or her daughters or the wife of the Attorney General Mitchell, Mrs. Mitchell, <laughs> who looked uh, uneasily out of her window and saw the specter of another Russian revolution in those <laughs> protesting masses. And we have to ask, will the wives of bankers, generals, corporation lawyers, and industrialists be firmer allies of women fighting for their liberation than working class men, black and white, who are fighting for theirs? And won't there be both men and women on both sides of the class struggle? If not, is the struggle to be directed against men as a sex rather than against the capitalist system. Now it's true that all forms of class society have been male dominated and that men are trained from the cradle on to be chauvinistic. But it is not true that men as such represent the main enemy of women. Because this crosses out the multitudes of downtrodden, exploited men <clears throat> who are themselves oppressed by the main enemy of women, which is this capitalist system. And these men likewise have a stake in the liberation struggle of the women, and I say they can and they will become our allies. Now, although the struggle against male chauvinism is an essential part of the tasks that women must carry out through their liberation movement, it is incorrect to make it the central issue because this tends to conceal or overlook the role of the ruling powers who not only breed and benefit from all forms of discrimination and oppression, but who are also responsible for breeding and sustaining male chauvinism. Just let us remember that male supremacy and chauvinism did not exist in the primitive commune which had been founded upon sisterhood and brotherhood. Therefore, sexism like racism has its roots in the private property system. A false theoretical position easily leads to a false strategy in the struggle for women's liberation. And such is the case with a segment of the Red Stockings who state in their manifesto, and I quote, that women are an oppressed class because if all women compose a class, then all men must compose a counterclass the oppressor class. So what conclusion flows from these premises? That there are no men in the oppressed class? And then where does this leave the millions of oppressed white working men who, like the oppressed blacks, Chicanos, and other minorities, are exploited by the monopolists? Don't they have a central place in the struggle for social revolution? And at what point and under what banner do these oppressed peoples of all races and both sexes 
join together for common action against their common enemies. So to oppose women as a class against men as a class can only re result in a diversion of the class struggle. And this, I said, had this, there was a suggestion of this in Roxanne's assertion, and I quote, that female liberation is the basis for social revolution. That was her central thesis. Now this is far from Marx's strategy since it turns the real situation on its head. Marxists say social revolution is the basis for full female liberation, just as it's the basis for the liberation of the whole working class. In the last analysis, the real allies of women's liberation are all those forces which are impelled for their own reasons to struggle against and throw off the shackles of the imperialist masters. The underlying source of woman's oppression, which is capitalism, cannot be abolished by women alone, nor by a coalition of women drawn from all classes. It will require a worldwide struggle for socialism of the working masses, female and male alike, together with every other section of the oppressed, to overthrow the power of capitalism, which is centered above all in the United States today. Now, one final point. On the connections between the struggle for the women's liberation and the struggle for socialism. First of all, even though the full goal of women's liberation cannot be achieved short of the socialist revolution, this does not mean that the struggle to secure reforms must be postponed until then. It's imperative for Marxist women to fight shoulder to shoulder with all our embattled sisters in organizing actions for specific objectives from now on. And this has been our policy ever since the women's liberation movement surfaced a year or so ago and even before. The women's movement begins, like other movements for liberation, by putting forward elementary demands, such as equal opportunities with men in education, jobs and pay, for free abortions on demand, for child care centers financed by the government but controlled by the community, and so on. Mobilizing women behind these issues not only gives us the possibility of securing some improvements, which we have get, certainly gained in some states, but exposes, curbs, and modifies the very worst aspect of their subordination in this society. Second, why do women have to lead their own struggle for liberation, even though in the end of the combined anti-capitalist offensive of the whole working class will be required for the victory of the socialist revolution? The reason is that no segment of society which has been subjected to oppression, whether it consists of third world people or women, can delegate the leadership and promotion of their fight for freedom to other forces, even though these other forces can act as allies. So we reject the attitude of some tendencies which say they are Marxist, but refuse to acknowledge that women have to lead and organize their own independent struggle for emancipation, just as they cannot understand why blacks must do the same. It's the maxim of the Irish revolutionists that tells us the score on this, who would be free themselves to strike the blow. And this fully applies to the cause of women's liberation. Women must themselves strike the blows to gain their freedom, and it holds true after the anti-capitalist revolution, just as before. Now, in this struggle, and as part of it, we will, of course, re-educate men who have been brainwashed into believing that women are naturally the inferior sex due to some flaws in their biological makeup. And men will have to learn that in the hierarchy of oppressions created by capitalism, chauvinism and dominance is another weapon in the hands of the master class for maintaining its rule. The exploited working man, confronted by the even worse plight of his dependent housewife, cannot be complacent about it. He must be made to see that the, the source of the oppressive power that has really degraded them both. 
And finally, to say that women form a separate caste or class must logically lead to extremely pessimistic conclusions with regard to the antagonism between the sexes as contrasted with the revolutionary optimism of the Marxists. For unless the two sexes are to be totally separated or the men liquidated, it would seem that they would have to remain perpetually at war with each other. As Marxists, we have a more realistic and hopeful message. We deny that women's inferiority was predestined by her biological makeup or that it has always existed. And far from being eternal, women's subjugation and the hostility between the sexes are no more than a few thousand years old. And they were produced by the drastic social change which brought into existence the family, private property, and the state. So this view of history points up the necessity for a no less thoroughgoing revolution in socioeconomic relations to uproot the causes of inequality and to achieve full emancipation for our sex. And this is the purpose and promise of the socialist program and what we are fighting for. I'll take the uh, questions. You want this one? You want it? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but yeah. The, uh, I have, so to speak, invented the term fratriarchy as a component element of the matriarchy for, for now and for my future work, because it's an element in the matriarchy that has uh, partially been overlooked and, explain, and throws a great deal of light on the matriarchy. Namely, if you talk about the matriarchy, people will wonder, well, where are the men? Were there no men existing in the matriarchal society? Now, we know that there were men there, and in tribal society, they call themselves the Brotherhood. And the freighters, P-H-R-A-T, you know, freighters, in all those terms, have to do with that Brotherhood. So it's spelled a little differently than the way I spell it. I spell it with an S. In any case, I do that to show the other side of the picture of the tribal commune, which was composed not merely of women or matriarchs, but uh, of men, brothers, elder brothers called mother's brothers and younger brothers and so on. That was the way they characterized these things. Now, where does the change from the uh, fratriarchy to the patriarchy come in? Most of the... uh, the supporters of the matriarchal thesis will speak of the uh, downfall of the matriarchy. And then it appears that uh, all men got together as men and threw the women out of power. But the real, the reality is this. Some men who became owners of wealth and power threw the majority of other men out of power out of uh, into a subjugated class and that sheds a good deal of light on what happened to the women it wasn't a a struggle simply of men against women it was a struggle of some men against other men and this helps to determine i don't want to go into the whole analysis of here but this helps you to see how the transition took place from a non-class society pre-class society into a class society in which a small ruling class um, exploited the great majority of men and all women were exploited because they came into the family situation. Does that make it clearer? Well, you may have another question a little bit later. Okay. Along the same line, um, how come if the 
Why is it, this is the other side of the same question, um, why is it the women who had such, were occupied such an eminent place and had so much authority, why wasn't it they who came into possession of private property instead of the men? Of course, you know, this is a great big unanswered question that has never been answered by anybody and I have given you a hint of the answer in the other, on the other side on the question of the uh, class forces that arose in the in institution of private property and so on. This is the other side, more difficult to answer. And one in which, uh, which I hope to answer, uh, at least in part. Um, the women were, uh, created the system of primitive communism. It uh, was not to their advantage to have any other kind of a system, because they are the child bearers. It's very convenient for women um, for their own freedom and sense of freedom and if there's, that there not be private property, wealth, and a little individual family because as you can see, life itself is demonstrated. It, is, it, it uh, binds them and chains them. Um, whether this was so much a part of their whole characteristic over so many millennia that they could not um, engage in private property or not, I don't know. It probably has, it was an element in it. In any case, there was also another natural, a whole series of natural factors of how and why the transition from communal property to the ownership of private property came up in such a subtle way behind the backs of certain men that only at a certain point, and it came up that way through men through the original fraternal exchange interchange which became private property exchange. Really goes from the interchange to the exchange system. That uh, you get a hint of how and why it was the men who uh, became the owners of private property. And then through them, of course, Adelaide, the women also did as their wives. But it's a very uh, important, subtle question that has not been answered yet. I, I, yes, go ahead. Are there other questions? Quite often, women ask 
It would be, that would be too big a job, but let me, let me show the other side of the question. And, and that requires a whole book, that exposition. But let me show, as Marxists, let us see the other side of the question. Primitive communism could not survive because it was founded upon a, a, a too lowly an economic level. A hunting and gathering, or even supplemented by horticulture, uh, a society cannot produce enough wealth nor even enough populations to produce wealth. It is limited by its nature. It was primitive. And uh, therefore, it had to go. There is another aspect. Class society, for all of its evils and for all of its injustices, had to come in. It was evidently the means by which you could get the primitive accumulation of capital, that you could develop the know-how. In other words, humanity was placed under the lash, so to speak, in order to do what? To bring it to a stage of uh, technological development and know-how that would be sufficient, that would be big enough, adequate enough, upon which to build socialism. And, but we have reached that stage. Now there is nothing more that uh, capitalism can offer. Capitalism with great whip in it can offer. It can only destroy what it has already created. We have reached that stage. Capitalism has outlived its usefulness and it's, the, it's overripe and rotten and therefore must go. And, but the, the whole population has to come to see that and they are. Just think of the great enormous brigades that have already been launched into anti-capitalist motion. And the rebel youth, the blacks, the third world people, the women, and uh, uh, more coming on the way. So that uh, when, when uh, finally the whole working class, which has been bought off in this uh, affluent period for a period of time, gets into motion, you can see the enormous number of forces that will make the decision that this society has outlived its usefulness. So, it, but at one time, it played that kind of a part. It brought into being this kind of a... It brought into being the proletarian force and the technological know-how upon which socialism can be built. If anyone wants to add anything to this. Yes. But because so many other kinds of reasons are attributed to that thing, in other words, that it's part of human nature, or that this is the natural division between men and women. So it isn't really the positive side of that answer that they're really looking for or attacking, but it's all the other kinds of negative aspects of the male-female relationship that they're trying to kind of see their way through and try to clear away the flaws. So, even though it's a very difficult question to answer, and um, we may not have, and we really can't put our finger on a lot of things that exa exactly happen this way, kind of thing. Sometimes you can attack that kind of question obliquely. Mm -hmm. And in many respects, I think that you do a more effective job by attacking it obliquely than actually going into the this was from A, B, C, D, the material basis. Of the what I mean by attacking it obliquely going into this whole thing all over again, over and over and over again, about the question of whether it is human nature, whether it is more natural, whether it is, there is something inherently characteristic about the female nature which is different from the inherent characteristics of the male nature and all the rest of it. So you have to really walk all around that question uh, in order to really get at the thing I believe that really bothers people about that whole transition. 
Well, that's why I answered, I said this is a very big subject because there are, it's a multifaceted thing. It's also very dialectical. I tried to give at least on the point that she took it, on the material basis, you see. But there's another aspect, to all, and, and I saw your hand. Uh, she points out the question of human nature, you know, uh, very important things that are coming up for review. But what's happening in the women's liberation movement that is uh, somewhat unique is that it, through its impact, everything is boiling up to the surface. There is nothing left anymore unsaid or uh, and, and, and later perhaps undone. It's a very curious and interesting phenomenon. What are the diff biological differences? What are the social differences? What, what are the future? Uh, was the future of the sexes even apart from the material basis, assuming socialism and so forth. So, and the great curiosity on these subjects is what interests me. It's enormous, and it's endless. And I think it's exactly appropriate to a women's liberation movement. <laughs> what were you going to say? Well, yeah, I, uh, I was looking at that. I think a lot of the people of many women in the movement who thought about this whole question and who reject the idea that biology uh, nonetheless, feel uh, that the material reason is that men were stronger than women physically, and that's how it happened. That men, um, that all, that basically all men overpower women and establish their dominance. And I think at least part of it is true in, in, in the sense of iron was discovered and uh, weapons became more sophisticated, and uh, as men began to herd there were problems with other tribes. Um, and men's status was elevated by their ability to, uh, I assume, uh, uh, take control of certain herding area and you know, get the other tribe away. Uh, and then there was the whole aspect that as surplus developed and became possible to the tribes, I think the tribe appears to have played. And, uh, and individual ownership, and a lot of the um, a lot of the a lot of the women in women's liberation focus in on uh, on that whole aspect. I think in a fairly unclear way, and, and make it seem as if all men uh, were involved in this plot. Uh, let Let's discuss this question of which is the, uh, why men are stronger, and is there being is is the fact that they're generally physically stronger a key to their superiority? 
Uh, we had this in San Francisco, didn't we? We just got a little ways on it. And there are some women who, who take the floor and they, and they claim with great justice that it isn't true. It's a cultivated trait, and that's true. That if you take, if you take the life of a, of a hard-working woman, <laughs> of the proletarian class and the way she has to live and the, th lift and the things she has to do, I don't know whether a man in a steel plant uh, with some automatic equipment is, uh, is uh, any less strong than the women like that when they're cultivated into that strength. A great many women, however, especially of the middle classes, are cultivated into a weaker position. They just, they just don't have to do that kind of work. And uh, you can't argue against the fact that if you're walking on a street in general, uh, some man may be stronger than you are and can knock you down if you're a woman. That's a, that's a fact of life that faces you uh, and, and is clear. But to me, this is sort of an... Uh, so that I would say, and I agreed when the question came up, that um, the fact that, first, physical strength is not a measure of superiority, except that in, in that sense that uh, you are physically stronger than somebody else who is physically a little less, and so what? Uh, doesn't extend to every other, doesn't explain the social superiority of men, doesn't explain chauvinism, doesn't explain anything. It explains that in some cases there are a cultivated trait that uh, makes a man, men physically stronger than women. But it isn't true all the time, and it doesn't mean that women cannot be just as physically strong as men because it has been demonstrated. There's some women that can knock them out, too. All right. Now, what, what is the... Uh, I'll come to you in just a minute. What is, what is this fetish about strength? Let me give you a little historical picture on strength. There was a time when... Um, men, I'll just speak of the men, had to be very strong. They had to wear this tremendous amount of armor and they had to fight and they had to do all this kind of brute stuff and for whatever reason do you know the reason. Or in mines or in uh, hard labor factories they had to uh, work to the maximum of their strength and so forth. But why the fetish about it? If we can make mechanical arms and hands and uh, Derricks and uh, other uh, mechanical means for lifting great weights. Why does the human body have to be a, a, a thing of that kind? What is the fetish about, even for men? So that uh, men who are not engaged in all this hard work, and, and I, I saw something the other day that absolutely flabbergasted me right outside of my window. I saw tons and tons of rock in a huge thing lifted up by one man who was wearing a big watch and short sleeves and, and uh, short pants, one man in the cab who, who wielded this thing, I don't know the names of them, and lifted that monster up to his truck and then dumped another truck down and all done in 10 minutes. But why does he have to be that strong as to shovel all that, he or tw and a thousand others, to shovel it all onto that truck when the mechanical arm can do all the lifting? So uh, that's another aspect of the question of just pure strength, you know, physical strength. There was a question coming in here. Um, I think that uh, it's important to differentiate between physical strength in relation to work and physical strength in relation to personal combat because there's no doubt that women can do virtually any job. She can now in terms of relating her strength to work because in the 19th century she was a minor and all the other things. But the fetish around physical strength of development developed in the present movement, I think, because the female is isolated in the, in, uh, in the family unit, and in that situation she can be physically coerced by the man who, in combat, is speaking to his own and that's the reason for the fetish. And uh, we have to explain very simply that we must differentiate between uh, strength as related to work and strength as related to personal combat. Yeah. Um, but, but what I, I would like to know is, if anyone can explain to me, um, when there was the growth of uh, a surplus of product, did that mean that uh, it was not so necessary, for instance, for men uh, to hunt? And, and were they more frequently in contact with the 
uh, female organized community and was there actual physical presence one of the reasons why a small section of the male community could appropriate this that came up over a considerable period of time. The first appropriation uh, above the, uh, the primitive sharing of everything, which was shared in equal. The first, but you had, the minute you got into a little bit higher economy, you had to do big construction, irrigation projects, and a whole lot of things. And you had to assemble your uh, working force in wholly different ways and under different conditions. You needed surplus. The surpluses that came in were ways in which these people who were doing specialized work were fed. A certain group of people would uh, do the agriculture or the herding, and then other groups of people would do the metallurgy and other specialized forms. Wholly new series of, of um, divisions of labor came into existence. And surpluses were, in the beginning, used in order to provide for uh, these new divisions of labor. But then the surpluses grew beyond that into from, from uh, being given to those who were uh, conducting these operations and distributing them, and they became into private property. There are some books on this, in this process of early agricultural society and so forth that gives you a, a line of development there, and all you have to do is interpret it according to the, the Marxist uh, basis. But, it was, a, it was a process over several thousand years. It is possible then, you think, that the actual physical presence of a fairly large number of men could have done something to contribute to the, to the yeah. appropriation of yeah. by a section of the male sex as opposed to the female sex. I don't think I quite follow you. In the, in the earliest stage, the uh, men were the directors of a number of operations, and, and, and uh, men and women both worked, but the family system was also coming into existence. It was now being done on a farm family basis for it. It wasn't an industrial society as yet, you see. So um, uh, <laughs> it, there, it wasn't a question of the oppression of women as we know it. If that is what you're getting at. No, those there were. What I'm asking is that we had the question, the big question of why was it a section of the male sex uh, to appropriate the goods? And one of your arguments was that because uh, the communal society were so advantageous for women. Yes, which well, isn't that the question she asked? Yes. Okay. Yes, but also, I'd like to know is it a possibility that um, the section of the male sex appropriated the goods? Uh, not only because women uh, found communalism advantageous, but also because maybe they've been drawn more predominantly into, a, uh, into the community. They were no longer hunting, for instance, as much as they were. Well, naturally, <laughs> naturally. With this period we're speaking of is the period at which hunting now begins to be uh, tossed aside yes. and becomes a sport. So we are now have agriculture and stock raising and wholly new divisions of labor. And it is absolutely essential to elevate society to have such divisions of labor. Not the whole population earning enough for a day or a week's food supply for themselves, but uh, a sector, a mechanized farm, earn, uh, making enough food to, to uh, provide for all the people in the, all of the different categories of the divisions of labor. You cannot, as I said earlier, build socialism on an economy of scarcity and poverty. You have to do it on its very highest technological level which we have reached but the process by which we went from this earlier small scale surpluses inadequate surpluses and surpluses that also came into private possession to the present day you can get many books on that we, there are any number of books I can give you that um, view of it yes did you want to speak on this oh I wonder, how do you place women for housewives into these classes? My second question is, what are the middle classes in relation to production 
who are these women? What do they do for a living? If they don't work for a living, what do they do? What is their function? Do women belong to the different classes? Yes, they do. Uh, they, uh, if they're in the wealthy class, they belong to it either in their own right or through uh, their, the, uh, the right of, by way of their marriages and so on. Well, that's a fact. I mean, I'm not making that up. Now, how, how do, uh, what about uh, housewives? Where do they belong? Well, these women, I guess even if up in the wealthy class, if they have to fill out a census form, I imagine what they have to put on is housewife. Uh, I don't, uh, these, are, these are social categories that I didn't invent that exist today, and these are, uh, mean something to those who put out the uh, censuses. That's the way they're defined. All women uh, are defined as housewives, even those who work. If they have a husband and they live in a home, they're defined as housewives. Single women, I guess they don't define as housewives. Single women, I don't know how they define. <laughs> I don't know what the census category is for it, but I will find out. Uh, now, men aren't defined as house men, single or married. They have occupations. 